Well, Oki, thank you so much for that very nice introduction, and it really is a pleasure for Governor Branstad and I both to have the opportunity to speak to the Iowa Students Learning Institute. So thank you for giving us the opportunity. I believe what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little, give you a little bit about my background and kind of what led me to where I'm at today. Uh, talk about maybe some ways that you can get involved in politics and then talk about something that's been uh, extremely important and one of our main objectives since taking office, and that is making sure that we have a robust, trans, um, world-class education for all of Iowa students attending our schools throughout the state of Iowa. So uh, let me just start by saying what an honor it is to serve as Lieutenant Governor of this great state. Uh, Kevin and I, my husband and I have been married for 35 years. We have three children. I, we have six grandchildren and we have one more on the way uh, in, in June. So we have a growing family and it's by far one of the great things that I get to do is uh, spend some time on the weekends being a, a, a grandmother to, the, to our grandchildren. Um, I grew up in St. Charles, Iowa, which is a really, really small community. It was a community of about 500 people, consolidated school district, which really gave me the opportunity to participate in everything, and I did, and I often joke that it really has prepared me quite well for what I'm doing today, uh, because I did have the opportunity to participate in everything. I've never been one to sit on the sidelines. I like to be engaged and involved in what's going on. I want to be a part of it, I want to be at the table, I want to know what the problems are, and I want to bring people together to really work on solutions that can continue to move us forward. And really kind of that mindset has driven me throughout uh, my career. I've spent 25 years um, in public service. I love people, I love serving, I like trying to figure out ways to do things better. Uh, I started out um, working in the private sector as a pharmacy assistant in Mount Pleasant. Uh, before Kevin and I moved to Osceola, and when we moved to Osceola, I had an opportunity to work in the county treasurer's office. Um, I started as a motor vehicle clerk, so came in right at the bottom, uh, registering and titling vehicles, and when, at the end of the four years, the current county treasurer decided not to rerun for office. So I really had, ne I wasn't like the governor, he's probably gonna tell you, I think at four, he knew he wanted to be governor of the great state of Iowa. <laughs> Uh, that really wasn't in my plan and it wasn't something that I had anticipated doing. But as a motor vehicle clerk in the office coming from the private sector, I really thought we could do things better. We, we seemed to be handling the same thing a lot. We weren't utilizing technology. We weren't looking for new services that we could provide the citizens of Clark County. And so I shared that with my husband quite a bit. Uh, this is what I think we could be doing. This is what I think we should be doing. I think we should extend our hours and you know just different things that we could do. And so when the treasurer decided not to re run, my husband turned to me and said, well, you know, here's an opportunity for you to take those ideas and turn them into reality. And so I thought, well, yep, that is something I'd like to do. So that was kind of my impetus to enter into um, the political arena. I was fairly, we were fairly new to the area, so I door knocked the entire county, not only the towns, but I went out into the country. Uh, it was not unusual for me to park the car, travel into the uh, farmyard, uh, up on the tractor, and hand the, uh, the, the gentleman my recipe card and talk to him about why I thought, uh, I, why I wanted to actually service uh, the Clark County Treasurer. I um, was very fortunate to be elected uh, as a Clark County Treasurer and I was very involved as a county treasurer, both at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. So kind of the same thing. Uh, if you're gonna participate in an organization, be engaged in it, be involved, and you get way more out of it than you give in. Um, I served in a lot of legis uh, leadership roles, but I think also um, a trait of being a good leader is that you need to, at some point, step aside and encourage new people to step into those leadership roles because that's how you keep an association growing and vibrant, and that's how you build a good um, bench for future leaders uh, for the state of Iowa. So I stepped out and encouraged some of my colleagues to move into leadership positions. And then, again, I don't do idle very well, so I was kind of looking at things that I could take on or do differently to still be engaged. And at that point, um, our state Senate seat opened up. And so it was the largest Senate district in South, well, in the state of Iowa, geographical Senate district, seven counties in South Central Southwest Iowa. Had the opportunity to run for that office, was elected, uh, serving in my second year of my first term when I got a call from Governor Branstead asking if I would be interested in, or if I would run with him as the Lieutenant Governor of Iowa. So let me just tell you that was a call that I never, ever expected that I would get and so my message would be that find something you have a passion for, 
don't get so focused on what you think that path looks like that sometimes you miss unexpected opportunities that may come your way. So don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to look up and don't be afraid to take on um, amazing opportunities that you never thought or dreamed were possible. Um, ways that you can make a difference or get involved, I think, uh, look for those opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities to intern with an elected official. There's opportunities to um, work on a campaign during the summer. That's a wonderful opportunity to see what that whole environment looks like. Look for opportunities to do um, just something that you're passionate in and you can make a difference, whether it's a nonprofit, internships, or as an elected official. There's a lot of opportunities out there for you to participate and get firsthand knowledge of what that looks like. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our vision for education and then I'll turn it over to Governor Branstad. But as I indicated earlier on, you know, education has been one of our top priorities since taking office. And I think Governor Branstad's going to talk to you a little bit about um, the, really the historic education reform that working with the legislature we were able to pass uh, a couple sessions ago and is being phased in over three years. But I'm going to focus my comments on something that I'm just absolutely passionate about and I think it's a driver and a strong component of education reform and that's uh, STEM education. So um, there's just unbelievable, groundbreaking, innovative things that are happening in the name of STEM. But I'd like to know, this is just a test, how many of you know what STEM is? Oh, yay, give yourselves a round of applause. That's phenomenal. <laughs> We've come a long way because that wasn't always the case. But science, technology, engineering, math is changing the world in which we live in. So congratulations uh, on really understanding that and being a part of it. Governor Branstad uh, started the uh, STEM initiative in 2011 with the Governor's STEM Advisory Council. And what I tell young people as I travel across the state is whether it's a certification or it's a two-year degree or a four-year degree or a PhD, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is critical to everything that you do. And it really gives you a strong foundation to make the choices that you want to make for your career moving forward. I also tell the young kids that you just can't hide from math anymore. It's a part of everything that we do. So embrace it. Have fun with it because that is your, that opens doors for, for everything. Um, the other thing, how many of you are maybe interested in a STEM career? That's really good news too, because I'll tell you what, those are the jobs of the future. They are great jobs, and they are jobs that are available right here in the state of Iowa. There was a report that just came out uh, last month that stated that the average STEM pay nationally is over 82000 a year, and in Iowa alone, by the year of 2018, 72,000 new STEM jobs will be uh, available right here in the state of Iowa. So STEM is a key focus of our education reform. It creates opportunities for young Iowans. It keeps Iowa innovative and competitive and really keeps us com competitive in a knowledge-based global economy. Um, and there are great opportunities out there, whether it's STEM classrooms or internships or externships. Uh, Waukee Cats is another great example. When I hear juniors and seniors talking about doing rotations at businesses, that's exciting because then kids get an opportunity to see what that real world looks like. They get an opportunity to apply what they're learning and then math and science and technology has a relevance on why it's important to stay engaged in those subjects. So thanks again for giving us a few minutes and at this point I'm gonna turn it over to Governor Branstead and uh, he's gonna talk about his career, right? right. <laughs> Governor Kim Reynolds, thank you very much, and uh, I think you can see I've met my match in terms of energy, enthusiasm, and passion to serve. Uh, thank you for inviting the Lieutenant Governor and I to be with you today. We're looking forward to learning about your priorities on improving schools in our state. Students can make a real difference, so we're really glad that you're here, that you're interested and engaged. Um, I want to welcome you to the Capitol Complex on this beautiful day. We're in the Wallace Building, named after Henry Wallace, of course, a very important uh, pioneer leader from our state. And um, of course, we're real proud of our beautiful Capitol Building, which is just kitty corner up the hill. Students, for example, can be important advocates on ways we can strengthen and improve Iowa's laws. In fact, one that is being debated in the Senate today is our anti-bullying initiative. We're very optimistic that it will be approved on a bipartisan vote. 
We've been working on this for three years. We've had two anti-bullying summits. The Lieutenant Governor and I visited schools and we're really, really impressed with the number of students and teachers and administrators that have really gotten involved in trying to give you better tools to be able to deal with this issue. On February 10th, more than 120 students from Sioux City, Marshalltown, Cardinal, and Waukee school districts joined us in an anti-bullying rally at the state capitol. They helped send a message that schools need clear authority to address cyberbullying that occurs off school grounds as well as on school grounds, but significantly interferes, interferes with a student's educational progress. My interest uh, is that we get that done this year. We've been working on a long time. I think we've really perfected a, a plan that uh, has bipartisan support, overcome some of the objections we've heard in the past, and uh, normally uh, significant changes don't happen overnight. Uh, but this is something that we've been working on for three years and hopefully this will be the year. I want to give you a little reason why I became really interested uh, the lieutenant governor said maybe I was interested in running for governor when I was four. It was more like 14, but <laughs> I, had a I, great, <laughs> I had a great eighth grade teacher named Laura Seaway. She taught U.S. history in Forest City, and she was a dynamic teacher. Um, and she really brought history to life. She taught, and I think every student that ever had her could recite this today, the three R's of good government. And we all know about the Bill of Rights and the rights, one R is rights that we have as citizens guaranteed by the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Secondly was respect for other people and their rights. And third was responsibility. To be a good citizen, to be honest, to be conscientious, to participate, to vote, and to help other people. And I, I can tell you, she was not only a great teacher, but I remember even when she retired, and she lived in a small town of Burt, Iowa, she would see that every kid that turned 18 was registered to vote. And anybody that was away in the service or in the hospital got an absentee ballot. So she was just not only a great teacher, but a great citizen and inspired a lot of people, and certainly I'm one of them. And I, I look back and I say, why well, I'm governor today, it's because of Lyra Seawick and I had a lot of other great teachers too. Fred Smith taught Iowa history and I remember the experience we had there in uh, doing a mock trial and then going over to the courthouse for the final arguments, which was across the street from our, our middle school. And uh, uh, that's, I think, the reason why I ended up going to law school and becoming a lawyer. So teachers make a real difference and can inspire uh, young people and, of course, Yesterday we had the big STEM conference, 600 people involved, and six teachers were honored for their leadership in STEM. But there's a lot of great teachers around the state of Iowa that are actively engaged in these subjects and preparing Iowa students for the jobs of the future. Um, I'm proud to see that your group is focusing on improving education, and the Lieutenant Governor and I share that commitment. Uh, it's not an easy situation because uh, the state has a requirement that our budget be balanced. We have to live within our means. And so we only have a limited amount of resources. And one of the reasons I came back and ran for governor is because the state was not managing its resources well. You may recall my predecessor cut 10% across the board in the year uh, 2009. And since education gets the highest share of the budget, across the board cut of 10%, hit education harder than anybody. And I would have called the legislature back to, to at least, there would have been reductions in education, but it maybe wouldn't have been quite as massive. And then the next year they didn't fully fund school aid. In many years, the legislature would promise a certain level of allowable growth, and then they didn't have the resources to do across the board cuts. Those kind of surprises we wanted to end. And so we made a commitment to restore stability and predictability and make sure that the state's commitments are fulfilled. So I'm pleased to say that we have made progress in the time that we've been back since fiscal year 2011. We've increased state aid, state funding to K through 12 education. 
uh, by $554 million. That's about 22.7%. Uh, 20, uh, we have also embarked, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, on our, on our uh, teacher leadership program. I think that's important because uh, Iowa, as recently as 1992, led the nation in student achievement on the name scores. But we were number one in eighth grade math in 92, but today we're 25th. Iowa scores, for the most part, have stayed about the same. We've been stagnant, but other states would set uh, higher state standards and then align assessments with them and have worked to improve, uh, actually I have passed us by. And that's why we worked, uh, actually starting with an education summit in 2011 until 2013 to pass our landmark education reform, which is we call the Teacher Leadership Program, and it will, over a three-year period, add $150 million to reward teachers that take on more responsibility. This is the first year of implementation of that. We had a year of planning in 39 school districts uh, with about a third of the students in the state enrolled are receiving that money this year. It's already been announced for next year. Another 76 <coughs> school districts representing another third of the students of Iowa will receive that additional $50 million. In the third year, another $50 million will go. So then in fiscal year 2016-17, every district will have the availability uh, have the opportunity to have the teacher leadership system in place. About 25% of Iowa teachers then will have the opportunity for leadership roles, such as instructional coaches and mentors in helping other teachers with analyzing data, fine tuning lessons, and co-teaching. We are confident that teacher leadership will drive other reforms, such as high academic standards and a dramatically raise student achievement over time in Iowa. We're not, we didn't get to where we are overnight and we don't expect to be number one in America again next year, but hopefully over a 10 or a year or so period we can achieve that. I'm interested in knowing what you think about uh, how Iowa can improve its student achievement and how we can encourage and motivate students. I, I think teachers are the most important aspect of that because it was great teachers that I, I, I think really um, inspired and motivated me and I think just about everybody I talked to. Uh, yesterday, Chris Nelson from Kemen Industries here in Des Moines. Yeah. And that is a great international company that employs a lot of scientists. And he was talking about, they interviewed the scientists that worked for Kemen. And 66% of them said it was a teacher that inspired them to go on and become a scientist. So we should, for example, uh, adopt the, the, I would submit these ideas to you. Should the state of Iowa do as some other states have done and adopt a high school exit exam for math, science, English language, and social studies? Should high schools change uh, how we deliver education to make it more interactive? And I know that's going on in some of our schools. And, um, we would be interested in other suggestions or ideas that you might have, and I know you have questions that, uh, that you want to ask us about. So with that, I want to just say thanks for being here. Thanks for being involved. You can make a difference. And I, what I found, and I started my interest in politics at a real early age, since a lot of people don't take an interest, those people that do can have even more influence. So get to know who your legislators are and don't hesitate to let them know uh, your ideas and your thoughts on issues that are important to you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a couple questions. So does anyone have anything they'd like to ask the governor or the lieutenant governor? Yeah. Um, can you mention the high school exit exam that other states have yeah. Uh, what exactly would that entail? Would that be uh, requirements for students to have reached a certain level in their education before they can graduate? Or, uh... Yes, I think that's what it is. In other states, they have an exit exam. It's it, it just like, for instance, uh, if you're going to become a lawyer, you've got to pass what's called the bar exam. If you're going to become a doctor, I was president of Des Moines University. They have to pass three levels of board exams. 
I'm really proud to say at Des Moines University, 97% of our students that matriculated in medicine not only graduated, passed all three of their levels of board examination. But I'll tell you, those medical students are very dedicated, work very hard, and it's very hard to get into medical school because you have to pass the MCAT, the Medical College Entrance Test, to even get there in the first place. And you have to have a GPA in science probably of about a three, six, or seven. So how many think that's an okay idea? To have that. Okay. okay. That's good. Well, it's, it's, That's good. Uh, it's controversial. I'll yeah. tell you, not yeah. everybody it's thinks good. it's a great idea, but it would be a way to really uh, measure whether we're achieving what we want in terms of uh, student learning. Okay, other, other questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Yeah. Would this reduce the graduation rate because some students wouldn't feel they could pass that exam so they'll drop out? And I think that's, that's a great question because that's the other side and that's the reason why a lot of people think this might not be a good idea because it would maybe discourage some students uh, from continuing their education because they figured they couldn't pass that exam. Uh, and I don't have a real good answer to that except to say that uh, we hope that uh, providing remedial assistance and help to students could, could, could help do that. We're working on that right now for third grade reading. <coughs> it's part of our education reform. We know that if a student hasn't mastered reading by the time they leave third grade, they're probably not gonna be able to master their other subjects. So we're putting real, and we have this new reading resource center available to provide uh, data and, and, and um, best practices that schools can look at and how we can help kids that are falling behind in reading. But that's something we need to do. And one of the other things that we also have uh, this test now that's available, uh, the, the National Career Readiness Certificate, which I think every school now makes that available. And that's another great opportunity. It's voluntary, but it's a way to measure what your skills might be, and then you can identify where you might need to improve. And that can be taken early on, and then you can work to uh, overcome the challenges you might identify. Well, one more, we have one in the front row. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the teacher leadership program, and I have a great uh, AP English teacher at my school. Uh, I know she's uh, involved as a leading teacher, mentor of other teachers. And she's exactly the kind of person I think that would be good for that. Um, but I, I do know that last year we, we lost her out of the classroom on several days because she was involved in that. Uh, and so I'm worried, while, while I want her to be teaching with other teachers, I'm worried that, she, that might be taking her away from the classroom time in class. Well, and that's been one of the challenges of this. And, and, and so you're in one of the school districts that is already involved in the teacher leadership program. And that's one of the real challenges. Uh, a lot of those great teachers we don't want it just limited to the students in their classroom. We want the other teachers and other students to get the benefit of their uh, leadership and motivation. Uh, and so it's a delicate balance for them to be able to also, uh, you know, spend significant time in their own classroom, but also to spend some time mentoring other teachers and uh, helping to really improve uh, educational opportunities for all students. So, and, and, and I don't know there's a real easy answer to that, but that's the kind of thing that schools need to evaluate and see how it's working. And feedback from people like you, from students, I think is really important. And like I said, it's being phased in. You're in the first group. And so the Lieutenant Governor and I visited a couple of schools last year. Central Decatur and uh, Saydell had implemented, and we met with uh, teachers, administrators uh, from those districts, and we were, we were really impressed with what we heard. But, you know, now we've got another group of schools that are doing this, and uh, our goal is let's learn from each other and let's perfect and improve this program as it goes forward. 
I think one of the things, too, the governor talked about the um, education policy that we put together. It took two years to make it happen. A lot of traveling across the state, bringing all stakeholders together. This is really something that educators asked for. They really wanted an opportunity to have a more collaborative environment where they could work together. It makes professional development real-time and applicable <coughs> when they can have a lead or a mentor or teacher that really is excelling in their classroom do right during the lesson, do modeling or work with them or give them real-time feedback. So as the governor said, it's an opportunity to take that one great teacher and scale it uh, throughout the school district. And instead of 30 children having the opportunity to be in that classroom, now 150 will have the opportunity to have great teachers that they're working with. So it really was something that was driven um, from the educators as an opportunity to co to co work to work together and to have maybe real time better professional development in the classroom. And that $50 million that I mentioned, that goes to reward those teachers that are taking on more yeah. responsibility. Yeah. So they end up working longer hours and taking on more responsibility, but they get rewarded for that over and above their normal salary. We also have, as part of our teacher leaders, our leadership program, students that are in the top 25% of their class that go into teaching in some of these STEM subjects like math and science, but I think it also includes special ed, uh, would get uh, a stipend, if they stay in, and teach in Iowa for five years, of $20,000 paid over a five-year period. So as an incentive uh, to teach in those critically important subjects and to get more high achievers into the teaching profession. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.